Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm John Birch. I'm the uh, chair of the plenary and keynote uh, talk uh, committee for uh, this meeting. And it's uh, my great pleasure to be introducing our wonderful speakers here to talk about uh, OR and a AI. Um, so I'll introduce both of them, Ramaya Krishnan and Pascal van Hentenreich. Um, and uh, first I'll introduce Krishnan. Krishnan, as you all know, is president of Informs. He's also the uh, W.W. and Ruth Cooper Professor of Management Science um, and Information Systems at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Bill Cooper, by the way, was yeah. uh, an Informs member whom many of us uh, remember uh, for his, his many contributions um, to ORMS. Um, Krishnan's also the dean of the Heinz School of Public Policy, as well as a faculty member in the engineering school at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he has his degrees from IIT and the University of Texas at Austin. He does research on consumer and social behavior in the digital world. Um, and he was also the founding director of the Block Center on Science and Technology at CMU. Pascal? Pascal is the Russell Chandler III chair at the Milton Stewart Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. He spent many years at Brown University um, in computer science, and he led the op optimization research group at the National ICT in Australia. And he also spent several years at my former institution, the University of Michigan um, in Ann Arbor. Um, he's fellow of INFORMS and also the Associ Association for the Advancement of um, uh, AI. Uh, AI. Yeah. AI. <laughs> AI, right. AI. So he's also an AI guy, basically. Um, his optimization systems have been included in OPL, which many of you know, and CHIP. Um, in com and they've been in commercial use for over 20 years. Um, he's been working in OR and AI, and he's been working in applications in many, many domains. And so let's please welcome Christian and Pascal to inform us about OR and AI. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Um, what, I, what Pascal and I wanted to share with you um, is actually the work that's been ongoing for the past uh, year. Um, during the course of my presidency, a focus has been on articulating, developing and articulating INFORM's AI strategy. And the goal of the talk today is to give you uh, and share with you and solicit your advice and input as well, um, the AI strategy for INFORM's. <clears throat> so the talk is pretty much going to be organized along the lines of my setting the stage and setting the context and uh, providing um, a process-oriented view of how we are here today. And then I'll hand this off to Pascal, um, who's going to talk in a little more detail about the opportunities uh, that lie at the intersection of OR and AI, and how OR and our community, more broadly defined, can both uh, contribute to and benefit from this rise of AI. Uh, and then I'll, I'll come back and wrap up and talk about some of the concrete initiatives that we have planned and that are underway that I think will be of uh, value to all the members of our community. OK, let's kick things off. Um, you know, today we, we're in a world where uh, we talk to our phones, uh, we talk to Alexa, and that's par for the course. I mean, all of you, uh, I assume, have some experience in doing these things, and this has changed the matter, manner in which we interact with devices and the expectations that we have for the UIs, the user interfaces, uh, to the kinds of decision support tools that we have deployed in the past. Um, I'm sure many of you have also gone to um, countries where you don't know the language. And you've used Google Translate, I certainly have. Uh, where you would sort of type in what you want to say and you'd show to that person, that person would show it back to you. And it's not just about text-to-text, uh, -text, it's text-to-speech as well. So you have somebody putting it in something in Chinese, say, which then 
uh, comes back to you in English and vice versa, you're actually able to have a conversation as if there was an intermediary who knew both languages. And these are certainly things that have captured the imagination and the mind share that, um, uh, that you and I have sort of interacted and engaged with. But to move from perception, so take um, voice, which is what I started out with, uh, to image, this has again been something that you've probably seen. Uh, maybe these examples are not uh, particularly high stakes because you have a, a computer uh, or a deep learning algorithm recognizing a cat as a cat and not as a dog, and sometimes confusing a cat as a panda if it was a, if you changed a few pixels, but nevertheless, um, the image classification tasks uh, that um, uh, has been another uh, important example of perception that, um, uh, that AI has been able to um, see some big wins in. And if you look at the so-called ImageNet large-scale um, um, uh, verification test. This is sort of data that, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but the, you can see that exponential decline that basically says that the error rates are such where now these deep learning algorithms are producing better than human level performance uh, in these kinds of perception tasks. So these are clear and tangible examples of improvement in perception. So moving from Recognizing that a cat as a cat or a dog as a dog, you're now beginning to see deployments of image recognition to where you see face recognition with all the attendant kinds of issues that come with it in terms of ethics, bias, and concerns about how this could be deployed in appropriate ways. But today you actually are uh, seeing this being deployed in a number of settings where this is being used as a biometric mechanism for allowing you access into restricted spaces or even uh, entry into countries, things of that nature. Uh, I use these examples and the progression of examples is to demonstrate where I see particular opportunities for us and we'll talk about this in much more detail in, in Pascal's remarks. And then on to computer games. I mean, there was a, certainly we have had a, a whole range of um, uh, examples from, from chess to Jeopardy, but AlphaGo was an example of a breakthrough where um, you saw a very difficult board game, importantly between two players, in this case a computer and a human, where this particular computing algorithm was able to defeat the best uh, human player at Go. What might not be as um, well known is that a key component of this AlphaGo technology was a paper in 2005 from Operations Research. It was Monte Carlo Tree Search being combined with deep learning that actually was something that powered AlphaGo. Now, I, I say this because it's almost like we are Intel on the inside because the win that, that AlphaGo um, and the mind share and awareness that um, was attributed to AI from AlphaGo, very, certainly very relevant and appropriate, but some of the key methods underlying AlphaGo came from work that was actually done right here in this community. Now, if you look at poker, which is the picture on the right, now this is not a two-person game, it was a six-person game, okay? This was Texas Hold'em poker. This was Plutibus, which was a tool, and you might guess who the creator of this was. It was Thomas Sandholm. Thomas is both a AAAI fellow like Pascal, but he's also an Informs fellow. And again, something that perhaps is not as well known, but this is a, a great example of use of algorithmic games to actually create a tool that produced human and better than human uh, performance in a game. So now we're getting into decision-making tasks, right? So from we, we started out with um, speech, images, and now on to games where decision-making is involved. And you've probably seen this um, story about Google's uh, deep learning tool producing 99% accuracy in best breast cancer detection. Many of our members of our community work in healthcare. Um, now, you'll notice that this is a point solution to a particular problem, but many high-stakes decision-making tasks really involve systems of decisions, where 
There's going to be human in the loop decision making, prescriptive decision making, predictive decision making of the sort that's described here. But this again is an example of a big win. Again, the question is, what are the opportunities that arise by being able to sort of leverage these great improvements and advances in prediction, but be able to combine it with the kind of model-based capabilities that this community has worked on and combine it with the data-driven capabilities that have now come to the fore. So I've given you examples that I'd like to organize in four layers of a stack. I don't know if you can see this. Let me read it for you. The lowest layer is perception. That's where we talked about being able to collect data of various sorts, which may be structured, unstructured, images, text, etc. The layer above that is what can you learn from the data that has been collected. And as you know, at each of these layers, we'll see opportunities that exist for our community to be able to both contribute to each of these layers, but equally well for AI to benefit from us as much as we would likely benefit from AI. This is not a one-way street, it's, it's two-way. So perception, learning, decision-making, and acting. And that's the examples that I've given you largely fall into these four classes. So when we think about the impact that these developments that I've just out quickly outlined, it's certainly the case that it's captured the public imagination. I'm, I'm on the Hill a lot. I'm speaking to the House AI Caucus, the Senate AI Caucus, business leaders, and it's almost as if there is the easy button, it's called AI, and you press it, and boom, everything gets solved, right? Um, and it certainly captured business attention. Um, and it's, there's a tremendous amount of funding that's gone into, into AI. Um, and it's, if, you've, if you're, a, if you're a, an academic in this audience, you know that on campuses, this is certainly the case that it's attracted a great deal of attention, and appropriately so to some extent, on account of what the market is demanding. And President Trump signed an executive order on AI, and it's not just the US. Um, NSF has just announced last week a very significant institute level um, initiative around AI, one of which is, I think, particularly relevant to us, which is trustworthy AI. It's $20 million over five years and the multiple such institutes. Um, and this is not just the US, it's Europe, it's China. And if you compare that to the funding that the OR community has under NSF, it doesn't compare. So with the objective on the one hand of asking the question, A, how might we build external mindshare for informs and for our community so that we can both contribute to and benefit from this rise of AI. And then internally, how might we best build capabilities to, um, for our own community to take advantage of the capabilities we have built, but at the same time evolve in useful ways to sort of grow the toolkit of capabilities we bring to the table. I appointed uh, an ad hoc inform strategy committee on AI, the co-chairs of which are Pascal van Hentenrich, Radhika Kulkarni, Madeleine Udell from Cornell University, and Phoebe Vianos from um, USC. And the four of them have done an amazing job. And I think great credit to them and the work that they've done to produce a set of um, documents. And this is, in a sense, um, a, 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 an approach, an attempt to share some of the work that we have done collectively together with you. So, with that as context, what I'd like to do is to call Pascal now to share more detail um, and provide you with you know, the set of opportunities that now are in front of us. Pascal. So thank you, Krishnan. I, I think uh, the first thing that I would like to say is uh, thank you for Krishnan and Melissa and Grace for the, the leaderships that they have exercised in, in pushing us in, in exploring uh, all these issues. The other things that I want to say before, uh, before starting is the fact that we have talked to many people uh, in the community, both in industry and, and in academia, to get their opinion. And it's, uh, in, in, 
very interesting to see the wide variety of opinion that, that, that is there on the community on these issues, and we benefit tremendously from them. So I'm go first going to step back and talk about what is AI, because uh, after a while we realized that we, were, you know, we really don't, didn't know what we were talking about. So this is the definition of AI by AAAI, the, 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 the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And what you can see is that this is a very wide definition. This is a community which tries to understand how human thinks, but also how you take these, these principles of intelligence and try to put them inside machine, into building things in machine. So it's a very wide definition. And when you see uh, how, what the community works on, you will see that it's, you know, and many of these issues are reflected everywhere. Uh, but there is no agreement, even in the AI community, about what AI is. So this is what you see on this slide, it is the definition of AI in the main textbook, the most popular textbook in AI, that most you know, schools in computer science are using as, uh, in, in undergraduate education. And what you see there is the creation of rational agents we are able to perceive and act for realizing an objective function, right? So we're getting closer to, uh, to informs, right? And, and so, so as, as Krishnan has said, what the AI community is really doing is looking at a variety, a stack of, 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 of tasks, which goes from perception to machine learning to decision making and then acting. And all of this is in a feedback loop. You probably heard about reinforcement learning and organizing this stack, which is um, uh, addressing every one of these issues. Um, the, the second thing that I, and so one of the things that is important in this area as well is to tell you that the AI community is technology agnostic. They will take everything that works, and I'll come back to that later on. But they are not saying that, you know, we have a set of methodologies that we are using. They will look at everything that can help them solve the various tasks that are listed on this slide. So this is, a, this is a different definition of AI, which is coming from the business world. If you look at a variety of business magazine, they would have a definition of AI which is very, very different. And they will tell you that this is automating decision making in enterprises with the goal of actually sensing, but also continuously learning, reasoning, uh, decision making and acting for you know, outcomes, uh, business outcomes. And so this definition is actually extremely close to uh, the definitions of, of the informs community, the mission statement on the informs community, where you see mostly exactly the same thing. What, you know, using mathematical processes for complex challenges, uh, from you know, data to knowledge to insights and then decision making. So these two communities, in a sense, are merging, at least from the business standpoint. They are merging and addressing the same issues. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, to, uh, about is how this a AI revolution has been happening. And, and this is essentially the convergence of four things. And the first one is data, big data, the availability of very large amount of data. And this is a very critical thing. The difference between deep learning you know, 15 years ago and now is essentially data, the availability of, of data. And the second thing is the availability of high performance computing and in particular GPUs. And interestingly, this is coming from the video game industry. And so all these years that my son spent you know, playing video games are finally useful for something. And so, and so this is the second component. Now, obviously, deep learning has made you know, a, a tremendous impression inside, you know, a tremendous impact. But most of the seminal contribution to deep learning comes from the 90s and the early 2000s. So what has been driving the, driving the, the AI revolution in the last couple of years has been mostly data and high performance computing. Now, there is one more factor that I want to mention because I think it's very important and, 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 and people don't realize this. But one of the things that has been happening is the democratization of machine learning. So what is happening in the machine learning community is that the tools are free. You can get very sophisticated machine learning tools for free. And this has decreased tremendously the price of entry for business, for academics, for young researchers, for almost everyone. That doesn't mean that you know, using this system is easy. There is a lot of engineering issues which are sophisticated, but it means that you, know, you can get into this field without a massive investment in technology. Now, one of the consequences of that is that uh, the, the research community ex has exploded tremendously. What you see on this slide is the number of submission to AAAI, which is one of the main conferences in AI, one of the main general conferences in AI. 
And what you see is that between 2018 and 2019, you had a 100% increase, so doubling the size of submission. And this year for 2020, there has been another 20% increase. So this is a massive number of young people entering the field. And you may wonder why the two fields look the same from a business standpoint. Why is it that young people you know, are, are so interested in the field? And we had this discussion with Eric Orvitz the other day, and he was basically saying, but you know, it's really inspirational to work on tasks where you're trying to replicate human intelligence, where you're trying to do superhuman performance. And so this is the, what is captivating the, the imagination of the young people. So now the, the rest of what I want to talk about is trying to get you excited to move into this field, the intersection of AI and OR. And so what I want to do is look at a couple of things. First, I'm going to look at the business side, and then I will work into more of the academic side and the kind of opportunities that I think are really unique at this point. So the first, so I, I'm giving these talks at various places. In the, I've been giving this talk in, in various places in the last couple of months. And one of the things that I have seen industries after industries is the same thing. And I'm going to illustrate it with one industry, which has been a powerhouse of the, of the OR community, and it's the airline industry. And so, but it's valid in almost every industry that I have seen, even you know, very old-fashioned, you know, big manufacturing industries. So what you see here is essentially the use of machine learning uh, in the airline industry for food supply. So how, you know, what kind of meals are you bringing into the plane? Who is, you know, how much, how many, what types, and so on. And this is used not only in the US, but also in China, in Europe. Almost every airline is actually doing this at this point. Now, airlines will have been really in this, and this community has made significant contributions to revenue management in the airline industry. This is one of the <coughs> main contributions of the OR community. But at this point, this is also completely changing. Once again, because of the availability of data, the fact that when people interact with airlines, they leave a lot of digital traces that can be analyzed in a much more personalized fashion. They also interact, you also may interact with some airlines with, with chat. United Airlines is now uh, as, a, as a partnership with Amazon, if I remember correctly, for customer understanding. So the, you know, the airlines are trying to build an overall, you know, a holistic custom, uh, customer understanding and, and they are mining um, social media like Twitter as well. So what I think is going to happen in the next couple of years, in the, certainly in the next five years, is that the, airline, the way you interact with the airline industry is going to change tremendously. Now, if you board a plane, they will tell you that safety is the main priority, so I have to talk a little bit about safety. And so if you look at what is happening in an airport like Atlanta, if I board a Delta plane to Europe or to China, I don't have to show my passport, I don't have to show my boarding pass. The only thing that I interact with is a face recognition system. Same thing in China when you travel domestically. So you don't need anything else than your face, essentially. So um, computer vision is going to be useful for boarding, you know, uh, checking out your, 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 your bags as well. You know, once again, you know, no boarding pass, nothing is needed. Uh, so this is all the sensing and perception, uh, but this is a quote by the CEO of KLM saying that, yeah, we also have to move AI and OR inside operations. And, you know, they are working the talk, so one of the things they're dealing with now is essentially reorganizing their fleets, their operation under disruptions when you have a weather event or something like this, and, and, and they have deployed uh, uh, AIs and OR software for actually dealing with these disruptions uh, out of Amsterdam. Um, one of the things that I'm extremely excited about, and this is between business and, and academia now, is the impact of AI on engineering. And, and what I believe is going to happen is that AI is going to revolutionize all the fields in engineering, you know, civil engineering, manufacturing, uh, electrical engineering, healthcare engineering. And, and one of the things which is interesting here is that you will have to push the frontiers in many of these fields for AI, because we are now talking about human engineers or physical system or cyber physical system. And the learning is going to be very different compared to the learning that you do for images or speech or, or, uh, or voice. So this is, uh, you know, when I see these areas, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a young researcher again, and I don't really know which one to pick because this is exciting in, in all directions. Uh, let me go a little bit more into uh, technical things and, and, and more academic topics now, just to try to get you even more excited. And so, one of the, so the, the next topics are going to be all these opportunities from a uh, technical standpoint, but you also see that they will have directly uh, a business and industrial impact. The first one is probably something that you are all aware of. Uh, one of the main drivers of deep learning is stochastic gradient descent, so major contribution of OR. 
But what is happening now is that the, the new problems that AI is looking at are changing completely the kind of optimization problems that people have been looking at. So you're looking at massive data sets and some of the techniques that were designed were not you know, designed in mind with such a big data sets. Uh, you can reconsider the, the, the so, so, so AI has to deal with this generalization versus prediction accuracy trade-off. And that raises very, very interesting issues. Um, so I was talking to, to Stephen Wright on these issues, and one of the things that, that striked me was the fact that he was telling me that uh, the machine learning community is now looking at techniques from continuous optimization that have been long forgotten. They are in textbook, but nobody is necessarily you know, is using them. But now, you know, they, they may be reapplied to this new context and may be very, very relevant. Uh, smooth non-convex optimization is one of the topics that comes up all the time and, and one of the interesting things again is that AI is bringing a lot of structure in these problems and therefore you can add that structure to the techniques that we have been using and, and design new solutions. Uh, there is also a lot of debate about theory versus practice and which algorithms are good in theory, which algorithms are good in practice. And then debate about the theory. Computer science is a very different way of analyzing some of these algorithms compared to R. And both of them are actually complementary. Uh, this is uh, deep learning and understanding deep learning. There are entire workshops and, and, and conference now trying to understand what a deep learning system does. So Krishnan talked about AlphaGo and, and uh, AAAI this year there was a workshop on reproducibility. And you know, one of the one of the presenter actually reported his experience in trying to reproduce AlphaGo, and he was basically telling that in many cases you train the system and it doesn't get the performance that you want. You have to train it in many different fashion before you actually tune the parameters in different way before you get the performance that they actually had when they won the, the competition. So this is also a very interesting, a very interesting uh, topic, and and this community has a lot to contribute to this. You have probably seen these slides much more than, than you care about, so, but this is very important for this community, I think. So what you see here is that some of the deep learning systems now are not are maybe brittle to some modifications of the input. And this is okay for image classification where they still you know, beat most of the humans. But if you uh, operate in a high-stake environment, uh, it may be very, very different. So this community has a lot to bring to this, uh, to this particular space, using techniques from robust and stochastic optimization, for instance. So the, the, the president of AAAI a couple of, a, couple of, a couple of years back was basically giving the community a tutorial on robust optimization, so which is very interesting. We also have quality control, reliability engineering in this area. So this is, this, is a, this is an area where I think there are tremendous possible interactions between the two communities. Human in the loop decision making. Once again, the OR community has a lot of experience in this area. But what you see on the left of these slides is, once again, a slide from another president of AAAI. And he is, he is working now, and this is a big hot topic in AI. It's called human, they call it human aware computing. And it's all about assisting uh, decision making by human using you know, computers and AI. And so this is once again an area where I believe this community has a lot to offer. Now the next slide is actually interesting. Um, I, was, I, was, uh, I was lucky enough to, to, to participate in a workshop on you know, the, the next big technologies. And there was this professor uh, from Stanford and he put this first line, which I loved, which was basically the future of personalized medicine is the future of AI. And what he's basically trying to do is, is, is using explainable AI. Um, he's basically looking at deep learning uh, for uh, regulatory genomics and epigenomics. Don't ask me what this last term means, but uh, it's very interesting, I can tell you. Uh, but what he was trying to do is predict various kinds of chronic disease and, 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 and predict who is actually susceptible to develop them. But, but once he, when it, once he did this, is he, he opened the black box and tried to map that back into the genomes and try to explain what in the genome is actually explaining that particular disease. Now, deep learning doesn't do causal relationship, but it actually can point out where to look to actually find uh, what may be happening uh, when you are, when you are you know, exhibiting these diseases. Now let me get a little bit more, even more technical, and, and this is a topic that I think where we have tremendous opportunities as a community, is the integration of um, um, you know, machine learning and optimization. 
And there are many, many different ways to do this, and I'm going to mention a couple of them. The first one is machine learning for optimization. How can machine learning be used in some of the solvers and the, and the approaches that we have? And there is a very nice tutorial by Andrea Lodi and, and Joshua Bengio, Deep Learning and Optimization, on this very topic. You know, how do you learn a heuristic? How do you learn the cuts that you have to generate? So you can read that, that paper. It's a, it's a very nicely done paper. The second area is completely different. So D Dimitri Bertsimas has a paper on this, which is data-driven optimization. And here what you do, and I think Daniel Kuhn is giving a tutorial in this, uh, in this conference on this, what you start, you, you start with data, and then you start you know, from the data learning this distribution for robust optimization. And then you do optimization, multi-stage optimizations over them. Not a way for combining machine learning and optimization. Uh, Eric uh, Orvitz is going to talk, uh, he's going to give a keynote on Wednesday. He's going to talk about what he calls end-to-end uh, -end learning. It's very related to preference, elicitation, active learning. And what this is about is that you're trying to, to learn the utilities of people, but in the context of a decision-making task. So you cannot really observe this utility, you observe them only through the decision-making process, the optimization algorithm. So you integrate deep learning and optimizations to do that, and this is, um, this are, you know, they are very interesting issues, and some of my colleagues at USC are, are, are you know, pioneering some of the techniques in that area. Uh, this is, um, the next one is uh, one of the areas where um, I, I'm working on, but this is empirical model learning. You take a machine learning model and you embed it in the optimization, just the opposite of what I just talked about. And this is very important when, you know, what you, when you decide as an impact of what people are going to do. So once again, what I'm trying to tell you here is that there is a lot of opportunities. Not all of them involve big data. So the end-to-end the -end learning, for instance, is very useful for small data sets and is very important for that. And the other, the other things that I want to tell you is that there is this very nice interaction now between discrete and stochastic optimization and machine learning, a, a tremendous opportunities in those areas. Now, one of the other area with this community has a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of things to contribute is, is ethical, legal, and, and fairness issues. Many of us in this community uh, belong to business schools, and you know, uh, in every business schools that I know of, you have, a, you have ethics programs, you have you know, professor of ethics, and so on. And a lot of what the AI community is touching upon now has, has a, a, a lot of ramification in legal and, le legal and ethical issues. And one of the things that I think this community and the AI community and the technical people in those areas who participate in this process and try to shape the, shape the, the conversation in, in those areas. Now, when I was presenting all these things earlier uh, this week to Krishnan, he said, yeah, yeah, this is fine, but can you structure this? It's like a lot of different things, but no structure. And so the next slide is all credit to Krishnan and all the blames on me because it's not complete by any means. But we try to organize, you know, everything that I've told you is, 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 is something that could be the OR stack, the complement to the AI stack that you have seen. And so once again, what we, we're going to start with sensing, but this community, even in sensing, have a lot of contribute. We can decide what to sense and how to sense that. So, and, we, and this community has a lot of things in design of experiments, adaptive sampling, adaptive design. Uh, and so that's one of the first steps that we can contribute. Obviously, reliable prediction, trustworthy AI, I talked about that. And the interaction between ML optimization statistics is really important. No, the AI community has worked a lot on robots and things like that. Not as much on strategic decision, but this community has a lot of investment there, and this is very important in some of the business problems that we are working on. So the scope of optimization problem where machine learning and optimization can play as a, as a variety of scopes and, and timelines. And finally, I think this is also one of the areas where this community is extremely strong, is everything which is about evaluating the system, evaluating from a business standpoint, management science, but also from a reliability, from a performance standpoint, and the impact that it does on, a, on, a, on the enterprise overall. And so this is another area where we can actually uh, have a lot of impact. Now, there are two things that I also want to say is that what we so the, this community has been has been really the informs community has been really good in model driven uh, uh, re research and development, and what is happening now is you have this data driven methodology which is coming uh, coming away. But I think what we have as a community a big opportunity is combine these two things, and the combinations of the two is actually extremely valuable. So that's what I wanted to tell you. I'm gonna. Uh, and, and the, 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 the conversation over to Krishna now who can conclude with some of the initiative that uh, we are pursuing at this point. I can sense the excitement. I mean, it's pretty awesome. Pascal, that's terrific. Well done. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you heard 
me set the stage and Pascal gave you know, an overview of the number of opportunities. The OR stack, by the way, uh, is an example of something that we could actually put out and have folks in you know, a Wikipedia-ish way work on and improve and you can crowdsource it to make it even better. Um, but the idea here was to sort of lay out what the layers are and potentially where the opportunities might arise. Um, you know, what are the things that we should now sort of turn to asking the question, how might we organize ourselves um, given the stage that's been set? Um, and broadly, they fall under two uh, large categories. One is external facing, which is how do we sort of communicate to the external world who we are, what we are about, and how might we build on what already has been done? This isn't the case that we're starting from ground zero. There's been a lot that, that's been done, but how do we further um, build on what that's been done to date to actually communicate what this communica community can bring to the table? The other is internal facing, in terms of how we might sort of build and grow the capabilities and support the community internally. And to support this, Broadly, there are three sets of initiatives that are underway, and I'd sort of like to spend a few minutes on each of these in, in the time uh, that I have remaining. Uh, the first is you know, creating and articulating and documenting a strategy uh, around what INFORMS uh, will do both internally and externally, and that's a white paper that's in an advanced stage of draft, um, and that's well underway, and some of the material that you heard today is actually drawn from that. The second is reaching out to partners. Who should these partners be? What should be the nature of the partnerships? And what might the opportunities be that stem from those partnerships? Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, the CCC is an example of, a it's called the Computing Consortium. It's funded by NSF, SICE, the Computer Science Directorate, not the Engineering Directorate, and they have a set of agenda setting conversations um, with the view to then identify fields that become potentially targets of opportunity for NSF to sun, then fund and resource. We are in an advanced stage of conversations with CCC to see if there might be an agenda setting workshop that might bring members of our community together with the AI community with the objective of identifying topics and areas that NSF might want to potentially fund. The second is an opportunity to do summer schools or other such activities with partner, uh, partner societies, sister societies. This could be statistical societies, this could be ACM, these could be societies that are in complementary spaces where we have something to bring to the table, they have something to bring to the table. The objective would be that the communities get to learn and. Um, benefit from building trusted relationships with one another, which then result in, in joint activities. Advocacy. Um, as I've mentioned, there is advocacy internally and again advocacy externally. Uh, and in this, I think there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been going on. The Government uh, Analytics Summit that's being held in, in DC, um, the efforts to communicate to different parts of the policy organization, be it the Office of Science and Technology Policy, this is OSTP, um, which has actually been tasked with executing the AI strategy of the Trump administration, the um, uh, different parts of NSF, the different directorates of NSF, and different parts on the Hill, the House AI Caucus, the Senate AI Caucus, all with a view to try and communicate in various ways what this community can bring to the table. Now, let's turn from this broad statement of internal and external to what's actually already happening within INFORMS. The objective here is not to read that, but to actually demonstrate that there is a lot going organically anyways within INFORMS. If you look at the number of sessions at this, at this meeting that are AI related, it's actually a very large number. If you look at the number of keynotes, that are AI related, not including this one, of course. Um, there are actually quite a few that are out there. So in other words, this, this is not a top-down initiative. This is very much bottom-up and organic. There's a lot of in, 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 uh, in initiative and um, energy that's being invested by the community in developing these sessions. Now, in addition to that, uh, from an education standpoint, I think one of the things that you heard Pascal talk about, and I want to reiterate this, we spoke with 
uh, the chairs of the uh, OR uh, departments this morning as well about this. Um, the, the feedback that, uh, that you hear in talking to companies and talking to the DOD and talking to uh, government agencies is this combination of combining predictive, prescriptive, and econometric type of analysis. This is something that sort of is an ev evolution of our toolkit. There is tremendous interest in that mix. Now, if you talk to PhD students today, and if you're interviewing and you're talking to students who are out in the market, even if their program doesn't require this particular mix, students are going out and acquiring these capabilities. And one of the things I think it behooves us to do, and individual uh, universities and individual departments will choose to locate themselves appropriately in terms of what's the right mix that makes the most sense for their program and for their students within their universities. But I think there's considerable value in thinking hard about what should be the nature of the curriculum we should have and how should it evolve in light of these changes that are happening in, in the world outside. Um, and that's what you see here in terms of training the next generation of practitioners and, and scholars. Um, and this is not a one-way street, as I mentioned. It's as much OR for AI as much as it is us learning from their toolkit to add to ours. Uh, and then there is a, a committee on teaching and learning. Uh, Missy Bowers, who's our VP for education, has done an amazing job um, with this effort, uh, with, with, the, with the support of other colleagues on the INFORMS board. There's a number of activities that are being made available to help individual members of our uh, community um, learn new techniques or learn new skills or learn uh, to teach new courses. And one of the things that we are working hard on is asking the question, what can INFORMS do to support practitioners and to support um, academic members in the delivery of this new style uh, of education? Now, for those of you who've been engaged with the National Academies, you know, the National Academies have grand challenges, right? So one of the things that we are thinking hard about is having INFORMS come up with and create a set of grand challenges. And these grand challenges would be challenges that we as a community co-create, that, uh, that we establish. And the capability to then use these grand challenges to convene multidisciplinary partnerships and teams. These are not just informs uh, in any way restricted just to informs, but to allow for convening of multidisciplinary teams of people to take on these grand challenges will not only spur innovation and drive our community to sort of create new things, but equally well will grow the mind share for our, the contributions that our community makes in ways that heretofore I feel there's a need for further enhancement. Um, and it'll also highlight, I think, the breakthroughs that we as a community have not only created, like the example that I gave you of Monte Carlo Tree Search uh, in AlphaGo, but be able to highlight the sort of breakthroughs that we as a community come up with that can have broad scale uh, and pervasive societal impact. So what might these INFORMS grand challenges be? How should we organize ourselves to best create them, communicate them, and convene them I think is an important aspect of the, of the strategy. Then one of the uh, elements that we constantly hear about and have come up, with, come up against, both in talking to practitioners as well as to academics, in talking about how might we message the results of what it is we do, the median time to publish in our journals and to communicate the results tends at times to be too long. What's the right balance of rigor, of relevance, and timeliness in communicating these results is again a topic that we should sort of think about because it goes hand in hand with this capacity to communicate uh, our work, but also equally well, it shouldn't be an impedance mismatch that prevents us from partnering with other organizations, other societies that might have different cycle times in terms of being able to communicate uh, the results of the work. So in, in conclusion, I think we are a super exciting field. AI has certainly captured the imagination along the lines that we have spoken about. But I think there are considerable opportunities that lie at this intersection. And I think if we organize ourselves, and my uh, request to all of you is to join us in helping INFORMS put its best foot forward to help 
each of you, but most importantly, have the kind of impact we want to have on society. So thank you again for your attention, and thank you very much. <clears throat>